So, very good. Hey, well, let's turn to the scriptures. And um, the, um, so our first scripture is Matthew, the 28th chapter. And this is called the Great Commission. This is, this is Jesus right before his ascension laying out uh, the, the nature of how things are to go forward. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. Yep. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So it's not any, it's, it's going out. It's um, spreading the gospel, but it's also continuing to teach, letting people understand and, and uh, have Jesus be revealed to the people in their actions and, and in their teaching. Psalm 20 is a, is a prayer for victory. And, uh, and there's, there's a theme in here that has to do, we talked last week about um, how do we help people without hurting people? And we understand, we help people best when we understand that everything involved with poverty um, and with helping is really about healing for relationships. We have a broken relationship with God, with ourselves, with others, and with all creation. And Jesus Christ is about the work of reconciling those relationships. And when you do that, then the poverty is cared for as, as a side. Today we're talking about when worldviews collide, when worlds collide, a way of looking at the world in a material way versus God, looking to God for help in victory rather than to looking to our own resources. So both um, Psalm 20 and then the passage in Chronicles after that capture that. So in Psalm 20, the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for over your victory and in the name of God um, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord will help his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven and mighty victories by his right hand hand. Some take pride in chariots and some in horses, but our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. They will collapse and fall, but we shall rise and stand upright. Give victory to the King, O Lord. Answer us when we call. So throughout the psalm, God is the one who gives victory, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not the fact that you know, chariots were a big thing back in those days, not so much now. But like when you came to wartime, the armies that first got steel or first got bronze weapons over stone weapons, the ones that got steel over bronze, the ones that were the first ones to have the chariots, to have the technology, were the ones that had the tendency to win the wars. But over and over and over again, Israel found themselves the underdog, if you will, and it was really clear that it was God who gave them the victory and not because they had the superior technology. Um, so here, again, you see, who do you, who do you trust? Where do you put your strength? Now, in Chronicles, we have the story of King Asa. And so here's the question. Listen, and at the end, the question is, what was King Asa's sin? What was King Asa's sin? In the 36th year of the reign of King Asa, King Abasha of Israel went up against Judah and built Ramah to prevent anyone from going out or coming into the territory of King Asa of Judah. Then Asa took silver and gold from the treasures of the house of the Lord and the king's house and sent them to King Ben-Hadad of Aram, who resided in Damascus, saying, Let there be an alliance between me and you, like that between my father and your father. I'm sending you silver and gold. Go break your alliance with King Basha of Israel, so that he may withdraw from me. Ben-Hadad listened to King Asa and sent the commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel. They conquered Legion, uh, Dan, Ebelman, and all the storehouses of Naphtali. Then Basha heard of it. He stopped building Ramah and let his work cease. Then King Asa brought all Judah 
And they carried away the stones of Ramah and its timber with which Basha had been building. With him he built up Geba and Mizpah. And that time the seer Hanana came to King Asa of Judah and said to him, Because you relied on the king of Aram, it did not rely on the Lord your God. The army of the king of Aram has escaped you. And were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a great army with exceedingly many chariots and cavalry? Yet, because you relied on the Lord, he gave them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord range the entire earth to strengthen those whose heart is true to him. You have done foolishly in this, for from now on you will have wars. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in the stocks in prison, for he was in a rage with him because of this. And Asa inflicted cruelties on some of the people at the same time. The acts of Asa from the first to last are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. So how did Asa end up? In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was diseased in his feet, and his disease became severe. Yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but sought help from physicians. Then Asa slept with his ancestors, dying in the 30, 41st year of his reign. So what was Asa's sin? He, he didn't trust the Lord. He relied on alliances. He relied on... Um, uh, military means he didn't follow true um, with the Lord. So, um, Doug, can you get me to? Oh, okay, I got it. <laughs> to the first sermon, uh, we're competing here as, as we're driving the slides. So, as I said, what helping hurts. This has to do with different ways of looking at life and different ways of looking at the world. We have different views of reality when we when we are helping the poor or when we're making decisions about anything in our life, we're not dealing with a blank slate and we're, we're looking at things in particular ways. So if you think about this as our preconceptions or our lens or our ways of thinking um, that, and how, how, we, how we look at things, how we do things. And so there are different views of reality that, that seem to predominate today. One of them is a kind of biblical theism. And the idea there is, is that you have the cosmos, you have all of creation, you have basically all of reality, and you see that God is in relation to that reality. God is um, reconciling, uh, providing for, caring for reality, is connected to us. So, so that's, that's um, theism. You have then something called deism that in the age of enlightenment, about the 17th century, was predominant. And the idea there is there is God and there is the cosmos and God created the cosmos, but God is not actively involved or connected to it. Like God is um, like a clockmaker who made the clock, wound it up, got it started, and then hands off. Okay? And, and if you look at the founding fathers... Uh, Thomas Jefferson, um, George Washington, um, all of the various founding fathers and the, uh, the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and the language of that, all of that, most of that reflects deistic kind of thinking. So when it talks about inalienable rights and it talks about natural law and the pursuit of happiness, it's saying there are these natural laws that God created and God got it started and then hands off. And now these are progressing. Another way, which is this is kind of a modern way, is there is the cosmos, there is the reality, there are material things. And then that's it. That's cut off from, is there anything out there? Do we know of anything out there? Whatever is out there, if there is anything out there, is irrelevant and can always be explained through material uh, explanations. Scientific explanations, measured, observed, um, those are the things that matter. So, so what really matters is matter, is, is material things. No explanation about where it came from, um, where it's going to, but it's, it's just founded um, only on material kinds of things. And, um, and that's, that's the kind of the predominant view of the world, like everything. Um, everything, anything that's a problem is a material problem. Um, you, you 
use your technology, you use your means to, to solve that kind of problem. Um, it's one of those things that's it's kind of like, um, you know, the, the, well, uh, I'll be a nerd here and talk like Star Trek. It's like Star Trek, they have this wonderful, perfect society where they've solved all these problems, and there's no spirituality or religion or God anywhere in that. It's just humans have evolved enough in their scientific thinking, they figured out how to solve most of the problems of, of the world. Um, so that's a material worldview. Now, there's something else that's kind of like North American Christianity that has this combination of the modern way of thinking things and the biblical, the theistic way of thinking things. Um, and, and a writer called Darrow Miller has talked about this as evangelical Gnosticism. It's kind of an evangelical um, that has a, a separation. So here you have God related to things that are spiritual, but not related to anything else that everything else is physical and everything else is secular. So what happens then in churches and Christianity, especially in North America, is, is all this teaching is, is that there are spiritual things and Jesus is interested in spiritual things. Jesus is interested in your spiritual poverty. Churches, keep your mouth shut about dealing with poverty or economics or anything out there in the physical, secular, material world because that's irrelevant to you. The only thing that's relevant to you is what you need to do is focus on saving souls and not say anything or do anything about anything else because that's what your job is. And so, so we have that kind of connection. So, so, so does that make sense to you? Did, did you see? And you can see how when, you, when you're looking at things through those worldviews, um, how it changes your approach, how it changes how you handle um, all your various aspects of life. So, and, and this is one of the places where um, Christian students, it, it's double hard for you. Because what you do is you go to class and you learn all the secular material world's ways of looking at things. And then you have to then think about this through the lens of who God is and what God is doing in here. Is God is, if, okay, I learned that in physics. I learned that in math. I learned this in whatever. And saying, in light of God who is our creator, sustainer, and reconciler, how then do I look at these things? Somebody said one time that the physicists are the most religious people of all scientists because you have the a zoologist that are trying to explain animal behavior. It's like, okay, we can't quite explain that, but what's going on must be something that's happening in the brain or something so a bi biologist can explain it. Well, then the biologist looks at it and says, no, nah, I, I have no idea why he's doing that, but it's probably chemical, so the biochemist can explain it. The biochemist can't explain it, and it says, well, probably a pure chemist can explain it. The pure chemist looks at it and says, I still have no idea, says, but the physicist probably can explain it. And you get to the physicists, and they're the ones that are the mystics because they know they can't explain it. <laughs> you know, that, that there is something else, that, that there's much out there that is mystery that is unexplainable. Now, that drives some of them to belief. Um, but not necessarily all. So, in, in the modern world, then, the danger of this, looking at the, through the modern viewpoint, through this material viewpoint, um, and even looking at the material aspects of the evangelical Gnostic viewpoint, is that, is that this is a world where God is not involved. So you have situations that require some kind of saving, some kind of help. But God is not involved. So we get to be the God. We get to be the saviors. We get to be the ones who are fixing these things. And therefore, then we get the credit for it. Um, and so that's what it means when you talk about God complex. That's a God complex. God is not involved here. So if if we change that, if we are staying true to who Christ is, to how God is involved in the world, then we look at everything that is going on and saying not whether God is involved here or not, 
It's we know that God is involved. How is God involved? And if God is the creator, um, the sustainer, the reconciler, then how do we align ourselves with where God is already at work? And God is at work healing these relationships. Um, so, you know, and, and as I said, for Christian students, one of the things you have to be careful for is if you get Christian students who go to a materialist or worldview school, then you need to have a Christian community that you're a part of to help you to think through those things from a God's viewpoint. Because we're always trying to see things through God's eyes. Amen? See ourselves, see one another through God's eyes. It's even more dangerous if you go to a religious school or a Christian school that their viewpoint is this evangelical Gnosticism. So you not only have to think twice, you have to think three times. Because you have to learn the material things, and then you relearn their religious viewpoint, and then you have to untwist that and unlearn that in order to get to what Jesus really wants you to know. Unless it's a good theistic school. Um, but those are the challenges, is that some of the things that we hear about in terms of faith isn't really about faith. It's really about reinforcing our God complex, where we get to feel good, yay us, rather than, wow, this is just incredible stuff that God is doing in between us. An example of the material aspect of this is, is that, um, think about COVID. You know, COVID is this virus. And to say, in the world, it's like, okay, this is a problem. We can fix this. And how do you fix it? Well, you do the science. We've done great science on this. You do this research. We've done great research on this. You come up with a material response of it. We've got the vaccines. We know how to handle this now. And so it's fixed, right? No, it's not fixed. It'll never be fixed. Because you have the assumption is, is that, well, if the material fix of this is everybody has the vaccine, then everybody just gets the vaccine and material things, it's done, it's, it's fixed. But not everybody's getting the vaccine. And there's so much anxiety about these kinds of things. And there's people that are questioning the research that is being done. And it's so much more complex because it's not about a material fix for something that it's like a scientific fix for a scientific problem, it's because all creation is complex, and you have to fix those broken relationships. So when you come to somebody, one of the stories they tell in, this, in the, um, in the uh, book, um, when, when Helping Hurts, is a situation where they went into a place where it was a completely separate disease. And this book was written long before COVID and the vaccines and everything else, but it was really talking about a vaccine where everybody was praying to this goddess for healing for whatever this illness that was ravishing through the country. And then the missionaries came, and with missionaries came Western science, and with Western science came vaccines. And so then there were people that were worshiping the goddess, and, but then they switched their worship of the goddess to worshiping the vaccine. Um, so, that, so that, again, it wasn't addressing the broken relationships our broken relationship with God, being reconciled to God, to ourselves, to one another, and to creation. Um, so, again, it's one of those things. Poverty isn't fixed by throwing things at it. It's incredibly complex. And it has to, it's involving um, lots and lots of different systems. I mean, one of the things about poverty, well, one of the things about the vaccine, let me go back to COVID, is, is the issue is, is that is that you can do the research like they, they did that shows the efficacy of masks. But I remember who, who said it. Um, one of the scientists, one of the, um, the, the experts was saying is, but I can't, we can't convince people. You can't make people care about other people enough to take the precautions they need to take, that we know they need to take. But at the heart of it, on some level, is do I care enough about other people to the point where I will work in such a way as to not be a carrier of disease that could eventually kill them? Because 
I, I would have to live with that. You know, I, I would have to, God wouldn't be happy about that. Again, the material way of looking at things versus that. And then the other part of it, too, is, is that what we're finding is, is that it, with the COVID issue is, is that there are people who are resisting the vaccine or resisting the masks and the science and all those other kinds of things. Um, and we think, well, if it's, if it's an issue of education, then if we just give everybody the science and we just explain everything to people, then they'll get it. And we're finding that that doesn't make a difference. The facts don't make a difference. Um, and there's a couple of different things going on. One of the things that's going on is that there are people who hold um, deeply moral kinds of viewpoints. And one of the deeply moral viewpoints for some people is personal liberty. That at an extremely high value for them, and in some cases above anything else, is nobody gets to tell me what I am supposed to do. Nobody can make me do anything. I will do it. I will decide. Um, again, nothing wrong with that, but if a person holds that as an extremely high value and you say, okay, but what about things that clearly will impact the people around you? It's like, well, you know, they have their life, they're, they can do whatever they want to do, but my body, my life, my liberty, you, nobody gets to tell me to what I can do with my property, with my body, with myself, and everything else. The interesting thing there is, is did you run them into lots of inconsistencies, right? You know, because you have these people that are saying, my body, my choice. It's like, and this over here should be illegal. They should not be allowed to do that. Yeah, but it's their body, their choice. No, but that doesn't count. So there's inconsistency in that. The other um, really highly held moral viewpoint is, um, is purity. You know, it's like, I'm really, really, really careful about anything that I put in my body. Like, I don't know what all the ingredients are in these vaccines, and I don't know this and that and everything else. You know, it's just, I want to make sure that it's really, really pure. Now, if that person has ever had a McMuffin or Chicken McNuggets, you know they're not caring about what they put in their body, right? I hope McDonald's is not listening. I'll get a lawsuit on that one, right? Um, so there's a lot of inconsistency on that, too. Again, what is the lens that, that you wear? What is the viewpoint? As, as you make decisions about every facet of your life, are you willing to surrender that to God? To, to shine the light, to show you the way, to direct your thoughts? Are you willing to, as, as Paul writes in Romans 12, Allow the uh, renewal, uh, the transformation by the renewal of your mind that you may know the perfect will of God. That God has the ability to transform our thinking, to be able to do that. And one of the things we know is that the brain is infinitely adaptable and can, is changed. And so when somebody is seeking to see all things through a biblical or theistic or godly way of looking at things, it literally can rewrite your brain. But we have choices that we make. Are, are we going to seek God's way or are we going to seek the other way? So, um, it, so let me ask you, is the idea of, of multiple worldviews, is that a new idea to you or is that something you've heard before. How many would say that's kind of a new idea? Never thought about it that way before. Okay, so good. It's, it's not brand new to, to, to most of you. Um, so then the question is, is that, so as we're trying to solve problems, as we're trying to help others, this, is, this needs to inform you know, our decision making on these things. So then the focus ends up being more on relationships and building those relationships by looking at people through God's eyes rather than through whatever lens we look at. And one of the things, one of the things that we know is, is, that, is that if you can't, if, if you don't have the ability to kind of take a different viewpoint and look at your own viewpoint, you don't become aware that you have a viewpoint, if, if that makes sense. It's kind of like um, if you live in the part of the country 
and you never travel anyplace else, you may never know that you have an accent because everybody around you talks like you. You know, you know there's a Stewartstown accent. Yeah. And there's a Baltimore transplant accent. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I found this when I was a youth pastor at a church, and I said, you know, we're talking about, we have this activity, and I said, there's some crayons here if you want a Keller. And everybody laughed. I didn't hear it. Well, no, it's a Keller. Said, yeah, you said Keller. Said, yeah, Keller. It's a Keller. You use crayons. It's a Keller. And, and, and then he said, no, it's color. It's like I literally could not hear the difference between the, the terms because I always grew up with the one. I said, no, you're saying Keller, like Helen Keller. Well, yeah, that's the way you say it. It's like, do you wash your clothes or do you wash your clothes? Mm -hmm. I grew up in a family that washed clothes. So, you know, is it a crick or is it a stream? Or is it a creek? So I grew up with cricks. So anyway, it, it's, it's one of those parts of it where you can grow up in a church, you can grow up in your community, you can grow up in a culture and not even realize that you're looking at life, at world, at reality in a particular way. And until you recognize it and name it, you can't see that it's distorting your view of what God wants to show you. And so we pray constantly, God, help us to see one another and ourselves through your eyes, the eyes of love, the eyes that know the heart, the eyes that see our true self and relate to one another in, in love and in truth. So, okay, I'm running late. So let's pray and then, and then we'll come to a close. Lord, we can't we can't see the forest for the trees. We can't see, uh, 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 there's so many metaphors, there's things that we could use to talk about how blind we are, even though we look, but we do not see. Lord, open the eyes of our heart. Open our spiritual senses. Um, help us to see as we align our lives with you, to see things as you see them, so that we may love as you love, that we may care as you care, that we may reconcile through your power and through your strength that we, depending upon you, might actually solve the problems you're calling us to solve with your help, uh, rather than contributing to making the matters worse um, because we're trying to fix something that may not be broken, or certainly because we don't understand the problem, we can't be the solution. But you, Lord, are adequate. You are enough for us. And to you we turn in love and grace, seeking truth through Jesus Christ our Lord.